So let's begin our discussion of the respiratory system with a short discussion of its functions. So the primary function of the respiratory system is to allow these air passageways to get gases into the alveoli, which are these sacs surrounded by simple squamous epithelium so that you can do gas exchange, oxygen into the blood and CO2 out of the blood, but not all CO2. There's a common misconception that carbon dioxide is strictly a waste product, and that's not true, as you'll see later. We also use the respiratory anatomy for odor detection, that is, that there are olfactory receptors in the upper part of the superior part of the nose and being able to smell different smells is important in protection. So one really good example is that being able to smell that food has started to rot or has gone rancid is a way to keep yourself safe from food poisoning. And one thing that you'll see in the elderly is that the olfactory receptors start to become less and less sensitive, and this is true of taste receptors as well, as we get older. Um, a place where you can see this defense in real life is imagine the last time that you walked into some place that's unfamiliar or someone else's home. Immediately, you can smell things that are different. Like think if they cooked fish the night before, you can smell it but they probably can't smell it. Those olfactory receptors um, adapt pretty quickly. So once you know that a smell probably isn't dangerous to you, then you start to actually ignore it. Your brain starts to ignore it. Now up here in the frontal bone, in the maxillary bone, there's also some back here in the mastoid process of the temporal bone, are sinuses and those sinuses are mucous membrane lined places that help you resonate sound so they help to create an echo so that you can project your voice the larynx is where the vocal cords are so as air goes over the vocal cords and you stretch muscles and the ligaments in there that's how you make sound so this is the pathway of air through the respiratory organs. It goes through the nostrils to the nasal cavity. We'll talk about functions of that. And then here through the pharynx. And there are three parts of the pharynx. There's the nasopharynx, which is posterior to the nasal cavity the oropharynx, posterior to the mouth or the oral cavity, and then the laryngopharynx. So this area of the laryngopharynx and the larynx is what I call the danger zone. So keep that in mind as we talk and we'll come back to that. Once air leaves the laryngopharynx, it goes through the larynx and the glottis into the trachea, which is the common term is the windpipe, and then to the bronchi. Now from the bronchi, it's gonna go into these smaller and smaller branches called bronchioles, and then ultimately will end up in these microscopic sacs called alveoli. So if you hearken back to A&P1 and tissues, you'll remember that all of these passages of the body or cavities of the body that have exposure to the external environment in some way are lined with mucous membranes. The mucous membrane here throughout the respiratory tract is one that's meant to protect us from exchanging and inhaling pathogens or gases, so gag reflexes, sneak sneezing reflexes, coughing reflexes, help us to keep those products out of the deeper parts of the body. Now this is a picture of the mucous membrane that lines most of the respiratory tract. This layer here, which is the one that lines the lumen or the opening of the nose, parts of the pharynx, the larynx, and the 
the trachea and then down through some of the smaller bronchi is lined with pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelia. The cilia here help to, they have a, a wave like motion, so they help to move mucus that hopefully has trapped any pathogens or debris and sweep it up and then out of the respiratory tract. So in some cases, you might sneeze this out, you might blow your nose. In most cases, without us knowing it, it actually ends up swallowed into the stomach where stomach acid will degrade um, any of those pathogens, we hope. Goblet cells, which are these big, they look like fluffy white bubbles. There's several one here, here, and here. Those secrete a protein um, called mucin. They have this protein called mucin. And when mucin is combined with water, it makes mucus. So you can think of mucus as sort of like a jello and mucin as the powder that you add water to to make the jello. So let's dive a little deeper into the functions of the different parts of the anatomy through the respiratory system. So it is normal for you to breathe through the nares or nostril, that's the external nares or nostril, and then air is going to come into here into the nasal cavity, which has multiple functions. One is simply that it's a passageway for air to move from the outside to the inside of the body. It's lined by mucous membrane, so that should be a moist environment. So this part also warms the air, it humidifies the air, it helps to trap debris that might be in the air, chemicals that come into this area. You see up here where the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone is, the olfactory nerve, the nerve, cranial nerve number one, that will gather smell information actually sits right here. Now these bony prominences are called nasal concha. The concha are literally pieces of bone that stick into the nasal cavity. So that gives you extra surface area, as do the meatus, meatus is, for mucous membrane to do all the jobs that we just talked about. Once air has gone through the nasal cavity, now it's going to go into the pharynx. And you should know the three separate parts of the pharynx. So air moves into the nasopharynx, then the oropharynx, and then just a little bit into the laryngopharynx. Another thing that you should notice here is that these areas here and here and here are tonsils. Now those tonsils are there to catch debris or catch pathogens, say if you inhale um, a bacterium that someone else has sneezed out or a virus that someone else has sneezed out. The hope is that those tonsils will catch that before it ends up in the respiratory passages and then ultimately in your blood or in your body tissues. Here I should also point out some tissue changes. So where we had pseudostratified ciliated columnar in the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx, when we get here to the oro and laryngopharynx, we change to a stratified squamous because this area is shared by both food, which can be abrasive, or liquids that can maybe be really hot or really cold and need, you need some more protection there. And it's also what I call a danger zone. So I'm gonna show you a video about why this is a danger zone, meaning think about why is it unsafe to talk and, and eat at the same time. We all know that it's not necessarily polite, but it's also dangerous. Follow. A food bolus is voluntarily pressed by the tongue up against the roof of the mouth and backwards towards the pharynx. In response to activation of pharyngeal pressure receptors, the swallowing center in the medulla initiates reflexes that prevent food entry into respiratory passageways. The uvula contracts, which blocks the nasal passages from the pharynx. The laryngeal muscles contract, 
closing the glottis at the top of the trachea by tightly aligning the vocal folds. The epiglottis swings down upon the closed glottis. With all airways blocked off, respiration is temporarily inhibited. As the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, pharyngeal contractions drive the bolus into the esophagus. So if we consider the fact that in order for you to make sound, air has to go through the, this area to the glottis and the, the vocal folds, and the epiglottis, which is elastic cartilage, would remain open. And the opposite is true if you're swallowing food. So if you're doing both of those at the same time, then those reflexes or the brain trying to initiate those reflexes becomes kind of confused. Do I keep the epiglottis open so you can talk? Do I close it so you don't aspirate food into the respiratory tract? So not a good scene altogether. So now we'll turn to the larynx itself, which is this area posterior to the thyroid cartilage, that's also known as the Adam's apple um, in a non-technical sense. It's also protected by the cricoid cartilage, which is inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And the thyroid gland is actually up here above the thyroid cartilage. But if you look at the thyroid cartilage from the side, and you can see the gland here, the idea is that the thyroid cartilage sticks out a little more. So if there was a glancing blow here, the hope is that the blow will move off the thyroid cartilage and away from the thyroid gland so that we don't have an overabundance or underabundance of thyroid hormone, which is responsible for most of the regulation of metabolic processes in cells. So the larynx itself has several functions. It helps to keep the airway patent, which means open, so that it's always open. It's also responsible, as you just saw, for, with the epiglottis, helping to root food and air where they should go. Because it houses the vocal cords in the glottis, it helps us make sound. And when the epiglottis closes over it, we are doing what's called Valsalva's maneuver. And the easiest way to explain this is if you bear down as though you're trying to have a bowel movement, you increase the intra-abdominal pressure, which is pressure within the abdomen or the abdominal cavity. And that is meant to help force fecal material down through the colon and then out through the rectum and the anus. Sound production for us is a pretty important function. It's a pretty important part of being human. Not that you can't be human without making sound production, but the pitch of sound may indicate um, danger or excitement. The loudness of the sound may do the same kind of thing. And the way that we actually make sound in speech is dependent on a symphony of movements between muscles that are around the vocal folds, as well as the muscles in the tongue. Those are the hypoglossal muscles, the muscles of the lips, the orbicularis oris, um, some of the labial muscles as well. So we're going to continue our journey through the anatomy of the respiratory system at the trachea. So we are right here. And you'll notice from that previous picture that the trachea is surrounded by these three quarter rings of hyaline cartilage. And the value of those is that they're flexible, but they also help to keep the airway patent, which means to keep it open so that breathing is really effortless. You know, so if you think about it, how often do you really think about your breathing throughout the day unless you're doing something very strenuous? It is lined with the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. There's goblet cells in that epithelium, so here, that will secrete mucus to help carry out debris or to capture pathogens or capture dust or 
um, particles that are in the air that you don't want to actually swallow. In the deeper layers of the connective tissue, there is this sero mucus gland, which will also secrete a lubricating serous, meaning sterile fluid. And that helps to keep the walls of the trachea from sticking to each other, along with, when we get to the alveoli, something called surfactant. Now the adventitia, let me switch to a different picture, the adventitia here is also called a serosa, S-E-R-O-S-A, in other organs. That is connective tissue that helps to anchor the trachea to the esophagus that's posterior to it, as well as to any of the other organs that sit around the trachea, such as the lungs or the posterior body muscles, posterior muscles of the body wall, or even the pericardium of the heart. The trachealis muscle only lines the posterior area, about posterior one quarter or so of the trachea. So if you consider swallowing food through the esophagus, now imagine that you ate something that was kind of big or maybe you didn't actually chew it enough. If this posterior wall of the trachea was fairly hard hyaline cartilage like these rings are, it could actually get stuck there and then you may choke or you may have food stuck in that passageway that would eventually rot. So the trachealis muscle actually helps to allow the esophagus to expand when it needs to and it does a little bit of anchoring and helps to move food just a little bit, helps to move food through the esophagus as well. So once air is moved through the trachea, now the trachea is going to split or bifurcate at this area called the carina, C-A-R-I-N-A. -A. It's a particularly sensitive area. It's one of the last places where you can, or your body can check to see if there's anything in that air that shouldn't be. There is um, actually a real case, it's not an old wives' tale, of an older gentleman in Boston that um, aspirated a pea and actually grew a pea plant. So the question is, what side do you think he grew that pea plant in? And I'll give you the answer in just a minute. So the trachea bifurcates into these primary bronchi, the left here, the right here, and notice that the left one has a fairly easy angle. The right one has a very sharp decline. And the reason from that for that is that the heart sits right here in an area of the left lung called the cardiac notch. Now these bronchi, which is the plural of bronchus, are then going to split into secondary or lobar bronchi where they will feed the superior and inferior lobes of the left lung or the superior, middle, and inferior lobes of the right lung. The right lung has three lobes because the heart's not there taking up some space. And then those bronchi are going to split again into tertiary bronchi or segmental bronchi. So we've got a primary here, a secondary here, and then when the secondary splits, it's called tertiary or segmental. And then the segmental bronchi are going to split more and more and more so that you have these passageways for air to the 300 million alveoli that exist in both lungs. When they get very small, they're considered bronchioles, meaning small bronchi. Now there's some tissue changes here to be aware of as well. In the trachea, there's pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. As we move down from the primary to the secondary bronchi, that transition will be into a simple ciliated columnar epithelium. The farther we go down, we'll lose some of the cilia, but we also gain some smooth muscle.
So we have now left what's called the conducting zone, whose job is to conduct or move air to this area, which is called the respiratory zone. And the respiratory zone has respiratory bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, and you'll notice that there's a considerable amount of, of smooth muscle here. Now that smooth muscle you may have seen in action or heard of, it's responsive to chemicals like epinephrine or albuterol in terms of closing airways or opening airways. These bronchioles are then going to carry air into the alveolar sacs and these individual alveoli. So if you look at the picture down here, you'll see that the alveoli each have their own walls, which allow for gas exchange to the pulmonary capillaries, but they're also kind of connected in a honeycomb sort of way. So if this alveolus isn't healthy or is diseased, then air could be shunted to this alveolus or this alveolus. So just because one alveolus isn't healthy doesn't mean that that whole alveolar sac becomes useless. Now a little anatomical reminder, the blue right here is actually the pulmonary artery or branch of it that's come from the heart. So it's carrying low oxygen blood. Then gas exchange happens here in the pulmonary capillaries where O2 is picked up and CO2 is um, dropped off to the alveoli. And then the red here is going to be a branch of the pulmonary vein. So that's one of the exceptions, one of the pairs of exceptions to arteries are red, veins are blue, arteries are well oxygenated, veins are not well oxygenated or meaning blood in them. So the walls of the alveolus itself are made up of type 1 alveolar cells, which are simple squamous epithelium. They're nice and thin. They allow for rapid diffusion of gases down their concentration gradients. That's a passive process, which is enabled by the fact that it's simple squamous epithelium. The greenish cells that you see here are type 2 alveolar cells who have a very special job. Their job is to produce a lipoprotein called surfactant. Now surfactant helps to coat the walls of the alveoli so that when the alveoli come close together as you're breathing out, say, that they don't just stick to each other. It's the technical way to say this, the chemistry way, is that surfactant decreases surface tension within the alveoli, which is really important. One of the biggest problems with preemie babies is that we don't start making surfactant until at least six months in utero. So if a baby's born before that, they don't make their own surfactant, which makes breathing really difficult for very small chests and very small muscles. The purple cells that are in here are our old friend macrophages. These are cells that perform endocytosis of debris or chemicals or anything that is antigenic to you, anything that's foreign to you. And as you'll see in my stat a couple of slides earlier, we get rid of about 2 million of these every hour. So the lungs themselves are tissue that helps to organize, house, and protect the bronchi and the alveoli, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. And they're not muscle. They're surrounded by muscle in the walls of the back and the walls of the chest, but they're not muscle themselves. They're mostly elastic tissue and some connective tissue. When you get a chance to feel these in the lab, um, it's, it's pretty surprising the first time you feel them, how pliable they are. They're softer than a kitchen sponge, really. So they are protected by membranes called pleura, and the pleura are serous membranes. So there is the parietal pleura, and this one lines the body wall, 
and then the visceral pleura, which is a very thin membrane that sits right on the lung tissue itself. Primarily, pleural fluid is made by the parietal pleura, and here's kind of an interesting fact that the turnover rate for this fluid, because you have to constantly recycle it, is about 0.1 to 0.15 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per hour. So the short version of that is there's pretty high turnover of pleural fluid throughout the day, which is a filtrate of these um, arteries and veins that you'll see here within the intracostal muscles. The space in which pleural fluid sits is called the pleural cavity. And the pleural fluid's job, much like it was with pericardial fluid for the heart, is to help resist friction or the forces of friction to help keep the outsides of the lungs lubricated and to help keep them protected as well from debris. And here's just a couple of notes on blood supply to the respiratory system. So when we talk about the heart and the cardiovascular system, we talk about pulmonary circulation. So that pulmonary circulation, the job of it is to help us do gas exchange with blood that's come from the heart and goes back to the heart. The lung tissue itself is supplied by bronchial arteries and veins. These are high pressure because they're part of systemic circulation, not pulmonary circulation. They also, uh, the bronchial veins end up dumping their blood into the pulmonary vein. So that means that you always have a little bit of mixing of this low oxygen blood from the bronchial vein into the pulmonary vein. So in theory, a pulse ox, which is a piece of equipment that measures um, in an infrared manner how much oxygen is attached to hemoglobin. In theory, a pulse ox machine can't give you 100%. Now, they may be calibrated to factor out the bronchial vein blood, 